Good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to what I hope uh, you will agree will be a quite fascinating conversation with two very interesting individuals who have come all the way from Delhi uh, to spend a week at Georgetown as distinguished fellows of the India Initiative. My name is Irfan Nurdin. I'm the Al Thani Professor of Indian Politics here at Georgetown in the School of Foreign Service and Director of the Georgetown India Initiative. For those of you who are coming to your first India Initiative event, I hope uh, you'll uh, sign the sign-in sheet so we can uh, pester you and let you know about all the very interesting things we're doing. The India Initiative has been around since November of last year. Uh, we have a website, india.georgetown.edu. You can see videos of past events and learn about all the other things we're doing. And of course, we'd love for you to be involved uh, in any way you can, especially if you have money that you're interested in giving the India Initiative. So, in which case, come to me afterwards and I'd love to talk to you. Uh, I'm not, we have a little uh, a limited time, and so let's get to the main event. Uh, our guests don't require much of an introduction, but allow me to offer one nonetheless. Ms. Sagri Kagosh is consulting editor at the Times of India. Uh, she has a long and distinguished career in TV and print journalism. She has a BA from St. Stephen's and an MPhil from St. Anthony's College, Oxford. And Mr. Rajiv Sardesai is consulting editor in India today. Uh, he is one of India's most uh, esteemed and renowned uh, journalists. Uh, he has a mighty new show which has concluded a very successful first quiz show. His book, uh, 2014, The Election That Changed India, was on the bestseller list, number one, if I recall, from uh, well over a year. And Rajiv can tell us exactly how long. You should buy it if you want to understand what happened in 2014 uh, and what the implications are for Indian politics going forward. So of course we will ask them to talk about that today as well. The idea over here, this is on the record, it's been videoed, so uh, you know, uh, journalist colleagues are familiar with the notion that everything they say will be preserved for posterity, but you should as well. Uh, so questions you ask uh, will be recorded and by being here, you're consenting to that. I'm going to ask Rajiv and Sarika a few questions to get the conversation started, but really, especially with the crowd as small and intimate as this, I hope that you will take the lead and ask your own questions as the conversation unfolds, okay? So, uh, firstly, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Joshua University of Vermont. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So, Rajiv, let me start. Uh, you tell us that in 2014, we had an election that changed India. Can I ask you to maybe give us an overview of what those changes are and maybe prognosticate as to what the next couple of years will Yeah, let, let me first put it that the, the title of the book wasn't my idea. It was the attempt by the publisher to draw in more readers. You know, it sounded nice to sort of suggest that an election can change India. I think in a millennial society like India is, which you know goes back to uh, uh, several thousand years before Christ, uh, you don't really expect one election to change your country uh, fundamentally. Uh, at the same time, I do believe it was a, what I would say was a watershed election. It, it really marked the end of what, what I would call in the book, the end of the so-called Congress era, of, uh, which really stretched right after independence, and right from the time that Mahatma Gandhi took over the independence movement in 1920. And particularly post-independence, there was a particular type of politics that the Congress was seen to practice. And I think the 2014 elections dramatically changed that. It brought India's first genuine right-wing majority government. And I think the implications of that are that that in its own way will change various aspects of Indian society and will change various aspects of the Indian state. Now, some of those changes that you're seeing are probably incremental. Uh, certainly one of the more dramatic changes that you see uh, is that you actually have a prime minister who actually is much more presidential in nature. Who's, so, so in terms of style, I think the 2014 elections changed brought in a certain muscular leadership to the fore, where the Prime Minister's office uh, has become, in a sense, the central focus of all executive decision making, almost to the point where the other institutions matter less and less. It is the persona, the, uh, the, the image of the Prime Minister that matters more than, than, than the institutions possibly. But in terms of the right word lurch, I think culturally, uh, you know, you have a notion of Indianness which perhaps is at variance with what the Congress saw as the Indian notion of, uh, 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 saw as its notion of Indianness. So you do have a, 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 a government in power which believes that somewhere the time has come to rewrite some of the 
wrongs of the earlier years. Now, whether those wrongs be in terms of uh, uh, relations between uh, communities, in terms of accusing the previous regime of what they call minority appeasement, and therefore pushing, for example, even now a debate over a uniform civil code, the belief that you know India needs a uniform civil code. Why do you need Muslims in India to have uh, to take recourse to a Sharia law? Uh, why do you have a national security doctrine uh, which is based on strategic restraint towards your neighbor but be much more aggressive in dealing with uh, uh, your neighbors in terms of your strategic uh, interests? Uh, a, a government which at the end of the day uh, would like to be uh, seen in cultural terms as, as a government that has a strong Hindu focus. Uh, you know, the Prime Minister of the country will not attend consciously an iftar party today, which was a tradition in India that the Prime Ministers went to a iftar party thrown by, let's say, a cleric or a Muslim leader, or in this case, even the President of India. So the President of India throws an iftar party, but the Prime Minister will consciously not attend it. I think he's somewhere sending down a message that this is a government that does not believe, as I said, in his belief in what are seen as symbolic token gestures towards the minority. Disregarding the fact, perhaps, that this is also the most diverse society with the third largest Muslim population in the world. But while it may be politically, while it may be culturally right wing, and politically right wing, is it economically right wing? That's the question mark. I mean, is this the government which is dismantling, let's say, the state? You know, the, the government talks about less government and more governance. But the fact is that the state still wields uh, enormous power in the lives of citizens. So it isn't as if the emergence of a right, India's first right-wing majority government has meant the dismantling of the state apparatus. You know, the government still remains very, very overarching in its, in its control almost uh, over the lives of Indian citizens. Uh, so I think, I think it would be, the jury is out whether one election can change a country. Uh, and I think what you are though seeing is the end of the Congress system of governing India. Uh, which was based on various patron client relationships, which was based on uh, the hegemony, unfortunately, of one family in the end, and a certain dynastical rule that came uh, as a result. And I think there has been uh, a protest in a way. Uh, you know, the, the, the rise of the right is also, uh, in a way, a protest against the way India was run between 1947 and 2014. A feeling that with a few aberrations, the Congress uh, Party essentially ran a government based on a old socialist doctrine, ran it on patron client relationships, uh, tried to construct a compact of secularism, which eventually, according to some, ended in minority appeasement, and therefore this is a reaction to that. And uh, I think whether, I think 20 years from now, we will probably be able to assess whether India has changed fundamentally or not. If institutions are taken over, by, uh, by right-wing ideologues, uh, whether, there's, whether they are then universities or whether they are uh, judiciary, if those institutions are taken over by the right-wing in some form, then I think there will be a fundamental shift in the way India is run. You're seeing some signs of it, particularly in the discourse at the moment over nationalism. What is nationalism? Who is a nationalist? Who is a patriot? Uh, and I think somewhere you are seeing definitions of nationalism much more in your face, uh, being defined by people almost as if they're giving certificates of patriotism, uh, uh, often based on a visceral hatred, even though it may not be overt at times, but it certainly uh, uh, exists, of, 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 of other groups, other cultures, other, uh, other religious groups. It, it does not mean that the, you know, India is going to sort of explode into religious conflict or clashes, but it does mean somewhere down the line there is a gaping trust deficit that is emerging between communities and between people of different uh, uh, ideologies in a way and creating an us and them world society. I think one of the great, uh, one of the greatest aspects of India has been its ability to hold together this, uh, this diverse society without creating necessarily an us versus them polarization. I fear in a post-2014 India, those us versus their polarity that might have existed below and perhaps were only papered over by the so-called Nehruvian socialism or the Nehruvian secularism. 
are now out in the open. You know, it's almost as if you are liberated to say things that you perhaps did not wish or did, could not say uh, a decade ago. And I think that is in some way bringing about a change in social relations. As I said, it may not be obvious in terms of, it's not as if the country is going to explode into religious conflict. But I think somewhere if this continues over 20, 25 years, you may have a society which in a way is, is a little more divided than perhaps it is, uh, 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 than it was 50, 60 years ago. I mean, this great project, I mean, India was created because India didn't want to be a Hindu Pakistan. I mean, the whole notion, the whole idea of uni university in diversity was presumed, pre it was premised on the idea that our nationalism was not going to convert India into a Hindu Pakistan. It was premised on the fact that minorities would have equal rights. And that's what our constitution guarantees. I mean, that, you know, it is a first class constitution because it was built on that notion of preserving that sense of, uh, of, 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 of the diversity of India. Now, if that is threatened in some way, or if there are those who say that, you know, there must be the primacy of one community, or there must be the primacy of one way of life. I mean, Hindutva is not described by even the Supreme Court necessarily in religious terms, but as a way of life. But if there is to be a primacy of the, that way of life, then you could be on a slippery slope tomorrow, towards 20, 25 years from now, becoming some kind of a Hindu Pakistan. I mean, let me leave you with the thought of, you know, the idea of a beef bag, or the idea of, uh, of cows, you know, these cow uh, protection vigilante groups. I mean, I think they, they work against the very idea of India. Uh, you know, I come from Goa, a state with a 30% Catholic population, with a BJP government in power. So the BJP chief minister there knows for political reasons he cannot have a beef bag. So the rest of the country, so when I interview a BJP leader in Delhi, he says that those who want to eat beef should go to Pakistan. What is, what is the message he's sending to those 30% Catholics who live in Goa? Or what is the message he's sending to tribal groups in the northeast of the country? And I, you know, if there is hope, it is the fact that because we are such a, end of the day, such a diverse country, it will not be possible to make India into Hindu Pakistan. You may try, you may, you may want to do it, but even the prime minister of the country, I think, knows. And that's why he's a little bit more cautious than his, than his foot soldiers. He knows that you can't make this country into a Hindu Pakistan. That to rule India, you will have to be more inclusive and accommodative. And that perhaps means that India will not change as much as some might fear. I think in the end, India will overcome, you know, they, invaders came from the 7th century. And they came to this country and tried to change India in different ways. India conquered them all. You know, there was no one who was able to conquer India and impose only their way of life on this great country. It's, it's just far too jelly-like. And it's just far too, you know, even within Hinduism, the cracks within Hinduism still exist. You know, when the elections were fought last year in Bengal, and the elections are to change India, two, uh, sorry, in Bihar, caste tr trumped over community. You know, the caste divides were so sharp that, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, the caste arithmetic of, of the government's op opponents defeated the government just two years after this, this remarkable mandate. So India's fault lines are just so, you know, exist at so many different levels that I don't see India becoming a Hindu Pakistan. But I would, I would not want anyone to be complacent because I think our complacency can result in people deliberately trying in some way to undermine the constitution and its republican values and impose their view on, 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 a, on, on, this, on this remarkable country. So yes, the 2014 election as a watershed moment I think changed India politically and the way elections will be fought in India. So maybe I should have changed the title to uh, uh, you know, the election that changed elections. So I think, I think elections will never be the same again in India. We've seen that in the United States. And in a sense, we also had a tele-democracy, or crazy, as you want to call it, where the battle was fought a lot on the airwaves. That's changed the way elections will be fought. India itself, I don't think will change that easily. Or at least I hope it won't, because I still believe uh, in its own messy kind of way, 
it is still the greatest country in the world. Uh, I'm sorry if I, if I sound unusually patriotic saying that, but I genuinely believe, someone just asked me, you know, uh, uh, from Mumbai that, you know, why aren't people more angry and rioting? I said, because Indians believe that we are a 50-50 country. And, uh, you know, the glass may be half empty, but it's always half full for an Indian. So you may be hanging for dear life on a Mumbai suburban train, you know, crushed like a sort of jellyfish, surrounded by hundreds of people in a, in a compartment that can hold barely 50 people. And yet you'll have a smile on your face. Or yet you'll be singing a song of a, of, of a Bollywood movie. I mean, where else in India, where else in the world will you need, in even the most difficult circumstances, someone come and give you a smile, but in India. You know, it is this remarkably optimistic society, even when people live in the most subhuman condition, which is why I believe, for good or bad, it is the greatest country in the world. Uh, so, that's a far more optimistic than I anticipated. So, <laughs> uh, so Sakharika, I mean, one of That's the, the American effect. <laughs> another very optimistic country, but that's right. the greatest country. Uh, Sakharika, can we ask you a question just to keep back a little bit? So thinking about your career in journalism, mm -hmm. right? So one could argue that for much of India's history, one of the common unifying forces has been a print media that was sort of English dominated, that was uh, that provided unified paper, that was secular, that was committed to those liberal values. Contrast uh, today, where we have a tremendous fragmentation of that landscape and of those social media. Do you, how do you think about those changes in the context of what Rajiv said about the broader societal and government changes? How do you get I think that's a very good question because you know media does reflect society. Media, of course, is a mirror to society. And when I started out in journalism, which was almost 30 years ago, uh, the English language press dominated the Indian media in terms of its salience. It was very salient. It set the narrative. Uh, it set the issues, and it was the media of record. Uh, the big newspapers, the Times of India, the Hindustan Times, the Indian Express. These were the sort of voice of the sober baritone that broke over the Indian public every morning and laid out the priorities of the nation and told the nation what to think and what not to think. And, and, and it was a very ordered universe as far as that is concerned. As my journalistic career has progressed, as you rightly said, there's been an explosion. And many have said that this is an uh, explosion that is characterizes goodbye journalism, hello media. Because you now have a media landscape which is dominated by television, which is big media, which is dominated by big money. And as we've spoken about so often in this past week, big media in India is not free media because it is uh, shackled by the advertiser and it's shackled by the proprietor who often has lots of other interests other than journalism. So big media is not free media. Small media has become independent and it has become the torchbearer of uh, and this has happened very rapidly. It's happened very, very quickly over a space of two decades. Uh, we saw in the early 1990s an explosion of television. And television at that stage was new. It was a new kid on the block, and there was lots of enthusiasm about television. Uh, and television started with NDTV, which was at that stage a very optimistic, very young, very idealistic organization. But then as television grew, the really big money players came into television and the priorities began to change. As the competition from television began, the newspapers began to change because they felt that their readerships and their viewership were being threatened by this monster of television. So they moved to a kind of more tabloid framework. So you had in the Times of India, page three becoming page one, or stories that were earlier relegated to uh, the lifestyle section becoming page one because newspapers got caught up in the uh, frenzy to keep up with television. In this frenzy, a couple of years ago, you had the explosion of social media. And social media, with its Twitter trends and its Facebook feeds and, and all of that, may not be available to a wider section of Indians, but it deeply impacts mainstream media. So as a result of which, the priorities of mainstream media are being set by social media. So Twitter trends, Twitter views, uh, tweets are being read by journalists, and these are becoming uh, actually news, uh, news stories. So we're looking at a situation where the media is commercial, it is sensational, 
and it was deeply politicized. Uh, there was a time when the media commanded a lot of respect from politicians, but I think starting from Mrs. Indira Gandhi onwards, that respect has started to diminish very, very rapidly. Uh, I think the journalist today is expected to be a handmaiden of the political authority. Uh, and uh, in today's times, in this particular government, uh, the journalist is expected to be a patriot and uh, a nation builder, a, a nationalist. Now, that poses a danger for the journalist. Is the journalist supposed to be a patriot or is the journalist supposed to report the truth? Is the journalist supposed to go to the war zone and report the story? Or is a journalist a soldier of the nation? Is the journalist a warrior for national values, whatever those national values may be? Or is a journalist a truth teller who's supposed to tell both sides of the story? Now, uh, this is what is happening now. So, I think what's happened in the course of my journalistic career is that I've seen a very sober, staid uh, media environment, which had its own problems. You know, a lot of the big editors in those days were uh, very, very tied up with the political establishment. They often worked as press advisors to, to prime ministers. There was often a cozy relationship between big editors and, uh, and politicians. You know, the great editors like B.G. Burgess or Kuti Nair surfaced. Uh, press advisors to Indira Gandhi or Lal Babu Shastri. So there was a kind of establishment centrist media at that time, but it was stay, it was it was slow. And I think now my plea as a journalist is let's go slow. Let's slow down. It's this fast pace and the speed that is really killing journalism. <coughs> and, uh, and and I think as I said, you know, I've seen an era where we've said we have to say bye-bye to journalism and we have to say hello to the media. Uh, so because of this, this, this rapid explosion, so from starting from that very establishment state position, we've now come to a situation where the media environment is chaotic. It's utterly chaotic and it's dominated, sadly, by right-wing <coughs> shrill voices which are mirroring the, 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 the move of the nation. Uh, I think, though, there is liberation in the chaos. You know, because of the chaos, because of the plethora of voices, because of the many, many websites that exist, there is freedom to be had there. That it, at least if big media is not free, if, if the TV channels are pumping out propaganda, if the newspapers are pumping out propaganda, at least there are the websites. Or if one newspaper is pumping out something, something, somebody else is some, saying something else. So I think there is no one-stop shop anymore. I don't think any of us can rely on a one-stop shop for news. I think we have to look at different places to get our news, uh, to get the to get the truth. Uh, and that I think is in a sense, the change. In a sense, the same point. If diversity will save us from being a Hindu Pakistan, the diversity that exists, the fragmentation in a strange sort of way. Is our savior. Is, is, is our savior. You know, the fact <laughs> is that you know, with 15 regional languages, 400 news channels, uh, uh, digital now increasingly growing at a rapid rate, you will actually eventually have far more sources of information that will prevent any one individual or any one grouping or any one ideology to control the entire media. I mean, India's, in, you know, and, and maybe that's what saved India over the years. You know, just the sheer size of the, uh, uh, of the country. Even the great invaders who came were able to conquer the north and then found south of the Vindya's life was very different. And as they tried to expand, uh, you know, their, their empires were under well, it's, it's except the, for the British. I mean, the British, for some strange reason, were able to do what no one was able to do for years. And even that empire eventually collapsed under the weight of one man who was able to unite this country from Kashmir to Kanyakumari with, you know, the sheer magic of, 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 of a simple idea like Satyagraha. And, uh, you know, Therefore, this is a country where even in the media or in, uh, or, or in, uh, in politics, no one individual or no one ideology is going to be able to remain there forever. And every time any Indian leader or any Indian idea uh, or any ideological belief has been, uh, you know, has based that we've conquered this country, the people of India have always brought them down from the great Indira Gandhi to possibly any leader in the future who, who believes that, you know, he is bigger than the idea of India. It's like Hinduism, you know, Hinduism's survival is really because we don't really know what it is. It's wayside shrines, it's a plethora of gods, there is no church, there is no set belief, there are no set doctrines, which is really the secret of its strength, which is 
why it is so diffuse and so jelly-like that it can actually conquer without even seeming to conquer. So there are the, the sheer diversity of the religion uh, is, is, is in fact the, the, the source of its great strength. And, and you know, one of the, one of the uh, uh, articles I had the uh, privilege to write was that, you know, I argue because I'm a Hindu, because now the feeling is that you're, if you're a Hindu nationalist, you can't argue, you have to say, take certain stands. But actually, Hinduism is not about diktats and, uh, I, I, and you know, uh, 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 a set belief system. Hinduism is highly iconoclastic. It's about asking questions and interrogating. One could argue from a cynical perspective that one way to interpret your answer is that you can't tear apart India because there is no such thing. Yeah, in a way. <laughs> That's very postmodern. <laughs> there is not a part of the nation that isn't quite a nation in a sense. But, uh, but I want to push a little bit on a couple of things you said. So, one of the consequences of that fragmentation has been the growth of regional parties. And it's hard to see those regional parties being put back in their box. Right? I mean, uh, so from a political perspective, from a political science perspective, the growth of regional parties right is a real change in Indian politics compared to an earlier Congress era of Congress dominance. If the regional parties in your assessment are also here to stay, what does this look like going forward? Are we talking about once again, broad coalitions and NDA and UP and type thing, are we talking about realignment in which it's everyone against the BJP? Right? What are we going to see in the state elections that are coming? Look, my, my, my sense, Irfan, is that from 1947 to the mid 80s, the Congress was the principal pole of Indian politics. Uh, and it had, and, and, and it, it sort of occupied that vacuum which had been left after the departure of the British, largely because of the legacy of the freedom movement. They were the great beneficiaries of that and were able to sort of rule large parts of India as a result of that. But post the mid 80s, it has been very clear that large parts of India are, you know, in almost centrifugal territory, is moving away from the center. Uh, the center has weakened and state governments have become far more powerful. Uh, it's almost as if you're returning back to the old era, uh, uh, the sort of pre-British era, where you had strong principalities and kingdoms in the Deccan, where you had strong kingdoms in, in North India, where you had independent rulers in Eastern India. And I think you're returning to that because holding India together is, become, it, it is very difficult in political terms. For one ideology, one belief system to hold, even the BJP after getting a majority, frankly, 90% of, of, its, of its seats came from Northern and Western India, from a swath from Goa, Maharashtra on one side to Jharkhand, Bihar on the other. I mean, that's where they got their seats. They got barely a handful of seats in South India and a few seats in Eastern India. So it's not easy even for a party like the BJP. So the vacuum that the Congress left as the Congress began to decline has been filled in partly by these regional leaders. Now, if I'm a Bengali today, I perhaps identify much more with the Mamta Banerjee than I do with a leader who comes in from North India and says, I am your ruler. I might still vote for you in a national election, but in a state election, I am looking for my state leader. I am looking for someone who understands my culture, who speaks my language, who uh, in a sense, uh, is, you know, is able to establish my regional identity. So identity politics and the rise of identity politics post, uh, post the mid 90s and, uh, 1980s and the decline of the Congress has led to the rise of these regional leaders who are satraps in their, own, or in, in their own world, often run regional parties like family party. So dynasty still remains very much there. Lalu Prasad, the other, you know, wants his son, his daughter, his, uh, possibly his granddaughter, all, all to run the party. I mean, his party came as some kind of a revolutionary party aimed to sort of topple the established caste hierarchies, but has ended up eventually as a regional party which is run, run like a Yadav dynasty. We call it Social Justice Private Limited. Yes, and, 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 and most Indian political parties have become private limited parties, barring the BJP and the left. Most, in, uh, almost every Indian party today is a private limited party, run by a, by a family. And I think the regional parties themselves, perhaps will, will eventually then face a challenge if they continue to run like private limited parties. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why the Congress declined. The Congress organization sort of uh, was undermined because you started running it like a private limited company. Because you're seeing that in Punjab. You're seeing that in Punjab. You know, the, the Badals have, uh, have, have, have run the party almost like that. You know, this was again a movement. You know, the, the Akali Dhan emerged in Punjab as a strong political movement for the rights of the Sikhs. But eventually became about one family. 
the, the social revolutionaries who are top of the caste system in Bihar and UP have converted their parties into private limited parties. <coughs> so I, yes, I think regional parties are almost a necessity in the times that we live in. If you live in Tamil Nadu, you know, you almost the, the sub-national streak that you have there, that person has very little, I've often said this, that the person in Lahore, the Pakistani living in Lahore, has more in common with the, the with the Dilli wala than the Dilli wala has with the person in Chennai. You know, the person in Chennai is is, 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 is living a life almost completely cultural, very different to the Dilli wala. You know, so so I think I think regional parties are a necessity, but if regional parties convert themselves into family parties, they too will face decline over time. And you know, you, to your question whether these whether you have a coalition government of all these regional forces. Possibly, but it's temporary. I think eventually you will, you know, you will have a more, you will have one of these principal polls emerging. At the moment, it's the BJP, but we don't know who will be the principal poll 20, 25 years from now. For the next 10 to 15 years, I do believe the BJP will be the dominant national party. And the question also arises: you know, are these regional parties really democratic forces? Uh, really, the jury's out on that. Because whether you look at the regional party in West Bengal, which is the Trinamool, or you look at the AIA DMK in Tamil Nadu, or whether you look at uh, even Mayawati's party in Uttar Pradesh, the BSP, these are sort of forces that are run by autocratic one woman show. Incidentally, the regional parties, many of them are run by women. So the future in Indian politics is clearly female. <laughs> and, and each of these women is, uh, is a complete autocrat. The party is run like uh, uh, without dissent whatsoever. The newspapers in those states and the press is completely shut down. Civil society is brought under the thumb of the of the of, of the government. You know, there was a phrase about Bengal. Tagore's great line was that the mind is without fear. But in Bengal today, it's really the mind is with fear because the Trinamool has simply unleashed a fear machine in uh, West Bengal, which is pulverizing the people. You know, and in fact, you see a people in West Bengal who are literally pulverized by the politics because politics is such a violent machine. Can I, can so I just show they're one, not uh, really you know, democratic. There's courses. one photo today which has come out in, on the website. You should go home and watch that. And it, to my mind, reflects the state of Indian politics. It's in Tamil Nadu. The chief minister of the state has been in hospital for 21 days. No one has seen her. No photograph. You know, there are all kinds of rumors swirling about the state of her health. She has, by some river, you know, some press release has been issued that so and so, Mr. Paneer Selvan, my finance minister, will run the government while I'm away. So what does Mr. Paneer Selvan do? He's holding a cabinet meeting yesterday, where all the cabinet meeting leaders are lined up in are sitting on chairs, and in front of them there is this larger than life picture of Jayalalitha. So she, the chief minister, who's 21 days in hospital, is apparently running the government through a photograph. And all the ministers are sitting, and each one of them apparently was told none of them should be seen in any view looking bigger than the photograph. <laughs> and the photograph must, the photograph has to be taken in the manner that it appears the chief minister is still around. She may be in hospital, not seen, uh, you know. So, I mean, what does that reflect? That's the point that I think in a way Sarvika makes. So, yeah, I mean, each of these women leaders in these regional parties are despots. So, I mean, while we celebrate the rise of regional forces uh, across India, we also have to look at the fact that, you know, elections are not just, a, a democracy is not just about winning elections, it is, of course, about how those parties govern, and I don't think the governance is particularly democratic. But, but I mean, so are the, I mean, there are male despots as well. Are the male despots. I mean, <laughs> let's not say that. But they don't, they're not, they don't, 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 they to run a political party, you have to almost have that despotic streak. Mamta, ba Mamta Banerjee told me, I have to keep those men constantly on guard. You know, she believed that if she was to try to be this democratic leader, they would try and take over the party. So you have to be despotic, you have to have a slightly eccentric streak. You, you have, have to cultivate a certain designer madness. You know, I mean, I feel that there is a, there is a, a you know, a lot of people. Oh, my here, a, a lot of people here have been telling me, why doesn't Hillary Clinton smile more? You know, she doesn't have charisma, she doesn't smile more. But you know, from the experience of Indian politi women politicians, if a woman politician smiles and is a nice person and all that, they don't radiate power. You know, they don't, they don't project anger and radi radiate authority. So which is why women politicians tend to be stern and, and angry, which is probably why Hillary doesn't smile as much as she should. 
know Indian politicians matter all that much. <laughs> <laughs> I think of the country Modi that we're on here. Modi does when he's abroad. I want to ask a question about another region of Putin's Kashmir. Uh, so Sanjay, you've done a lot of very great reporting going there uh, for Kashmir. Uh, 14 months ago, we had the honor of hosting Omar Abdullah here at Georgetown. And at his keynote address, he said, I hope the next time I'm here, we're no longer talking about Kashmir as a problem, we're not talking about violence. And of course, 14 months later, we have once again in uh, a prize in the conflict that is uglier, maybe nastier than a very nasty ugly conflict has been in a long time. Uh, we shall some thoughts on sort of what the challenges of as a journalist talking about Kashmir in today's context. I think the Kashmir problem. Is, uh, is getting worse because of the clash of two kinds of mentalities that continues to bedevil this issue. The Indian state looks upon Kashmir with suspicion, with distance, uh, with a, uh, with a, uh, as, a, as a law and order problem, uh, as a problem of militancy, and there is no genuine outreach on the part of the Indian state towards Kashmir. On the Kashmiri side, there is a victim complex, there is a feeling that uh, Kashmiri has been ha Kashmir has been hard done by, that Kashmir has not got justice, uh, and that Kashmir continues to suffer the discrimination and the brutality of the Indian state. I've traveled a lot in Kashmir recently in the past month, and frankly, I've come away scared. Uh, the new generation of militants who are there in Kashmir are not the older generation political activists. These are ideologues, and they are ideologues of social media. Because uh, at 9 o'clock at night in Kashmir, everything shuts down. There's no cinema, there's no restaurant, there's nowhere to go. The only place you can go to is the local mosque. And the only place that you can talk to people is the local mosque. And the mosque often will have people who have come in from all kinds of places who are preaching various messages to the young. Every video, every uh, 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 clip, of an injustice done to a Muslim in India, whether a cattle trader is lynched, whether a Muslim suspected of eating beef is murdered, whether Muslims are discriminated against in universities, when Kashmiri students are discriminated against in different parts of India, each of those videos becomes viral in Kashmir. So social media is spreading a kind of ideological militancy, which is new. And uh, there are young men out there who have a tremendous sense of grievance. And the Indian uh, experience, unemployed. they're unemployed. The opportunities are simply not there. I mean, there are many infrastructural problems with Kashmir. There simply isn't that kind of access to industry. The area is, it, it, it is naturally not blessed. I mean, there's, 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 there's beautiful scenery, but in terms of resources, it's not blessed. There is a lot of problem of transportation. The road connectivity is very low. Uh, there is a lot of infrastructural, there are a lot of infrastructural issues in bringing real development to Kashmir. But the sentiment of azadi, of freedom from India, is very strong and it's growing. And on the Indian side, what you have is suspicion. You have a certain Hindu nationalist attitude that this is, these are Muslims who are creating problems. They're all Pakistani agents. They're, they're, they're there to be put down with brute force, and there simply isn't that kind of outreach that should be happening. Uh, you know, there are in many, many positive stories coming out of Kashmir. There is a Kashmiri who stopped the IAS exam, who stopped the civil service exam, and uh, there are Kashmiris who are increasingly working in other parts of India. But I think the Indian state does not, at this point, know what to do with Kashmir. Uh, I really think it doesn't know. <coughs> how to deal with this grievance, how to deal with this Azadi sentiment, because it's not something that is uh, that is that can be done with simply you know, an embrace between uh, the Chief Minister and, uh, and, and Narendra Modi. I mean, the fact is, the BJP has got into an alliance with the local Kashmiri party, but the spirit of that alliance is simply not being seen on the ground. The fact is, RSS Tardas are going to the valley in Kashmir, uh, to, to Srinagar, and, uh, and going there and openly canvassing the RSS message among, among, uh, among the people there. So there's a huge sense of threat. Uh, I think the passing away of Mufti Muhammad Saeed, who was the uh, father figure of Kashmir, who was the kind of uh, the, the architect of this alliance, who was the sort of father figure of the PDP, has been a tremendous blow. Uh, 
Uh, and I don't think it gives a vacuum, as was built by his daughter, who is now the chief minister. But, you know, India, you know, as Ranjit said, India was not supposed to be a country whose nationalism was Hindu nationalism. Indian nationalism is the nationalism of principle. It's the nationalism of constitutional principles. It's not about Hindu hegemony over Muslims. It's not about Hindu hegemony over all Muslims of the subcontinent. And if that is the kind of nationalism that the Indian state is going to practice, there is no way that kind of belief system can win over Kashmir. Particularly because you've got a neighbor also, who whether you like it or not, is practicing jihadi terrorism. I mean, they have they have linked whether you like it or not, Islam. I mean, you know, there is the Islamic terror angle, which is which has been used by Pakistan, and and now with a fertile ground being provided with these unemployed youth who feel who are radicalized, you know, it makes it that much easier in a sense for Pakistan to play mischief. So you know, it is for Pakistan, it's one of the unfinished tasks of partition. You know, the inability to reconcile with the fact that Kashmir is part of India. For India, it is critical to retain Kashmir to prove that the idea of India is not only that a Muslim majority state can also remain within the Indian uh, geographical entity. So it's almost like, uh, and, 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 and you know, it's, it's almost like a, a bullock which has been tied with, you know, two, uh, two countries pulling the bullock from the horn from either side, saying, this is mine, this is mine. And the Kashmiri court in the middle uh, doesn't know what to do. You know, the 19 year old Burhan Wani, the, 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 <coughs> the militant who was recently killed by the Indian forces. Now, he was 19 years old, he became a militant because he saw his brother being beaten to death by the Indian forces, right? Now, he was under the watch of the Indian security forces. He was uh, almost captive, he was uh, completely under surveillance at all times. Now, my sources in the CRPF, when I went there to cover the story, said, you know, we had him. He was right there, we knew where he was. He was posing with his guns on Facebook. He was known as a Facebook militant. He used to put on his uh, uh, AK-47s and, and, and take pictures of them and put, put them on Facebook. Now, a dangerous person, but under the watch of the security agencies. The security agencies knew where he was, they knew exactly where he was, he was under their watch. Now, he was killed. Now, I mean, you know, the killing of Burhan Wani in a so-called encounter has, is what has led to this present level of uprising because he was such a popular figure in Kashmir. And the question needs to be asked, you know, that was the killing of Burhan Wani necessary on the part of the Indian state? When the CRPF forces are themselves saying, when he was right there, we could have taken him in. We could have taken him into the police station, bashed him up and kept him there. I mean, the need for the Indian state to kill Burhan Wani, who, in my opinion, was a soft target. You know, he was a militant, he was a dangerous extremist, but he was, a, he was, relatively speaking, a soft target. Now, what the Indian state has effectively done is created a very, very dangerous martyr cult. Thousands came to his funeral, literally thousands and thousands of young men, and young militants poured in from Pakistan. There were Lashkar commanders within that uh, funeral. There were other extremist commanders within that funeral. There are videos of them within that funeral. And it's, it's become a test case of yet another brutality by the Indian forces <coughs> on young Kashmiri boys. But that's, and, that's, that's one narrative. So the that's, other, that's the other, one the narrative. Other, the other narrative is the Pakistani narrative. You know, then, look, let, let's be clear. You know, the, the, the Pakistanis have used this the, the sort of unstable situation that has existed in the valley where virtually two generations of Kashmiris have, have, have not been able to have normal lives to their great advantage. I mean, the Pakistani state, whether one likes it or not, has used uh, the military complex, the political military complex of the Pakistani state, has, has in itself tried to retain its relevance by using Kashmir as, you know, to, to pour in terrorists. Let's not, you know, let's not minimize that. You know, it's not easy. You know, it's not easy to achieve for, for, for India to, to to achieve a semblance of normalcy when a neighbor is going to you know is going to stoke the fires of, of, of terror and and, 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 and and promote a cult of violence. You know, like it, it would be nice as you know to, to, to sort of see Buran Wani as some kind of a, a Facebook terrorist. The fact is he had a gun. No, you know, but the fact is, he was a soft target. Uh, he was a soft target for the for the security forces. Uh, he may be, that may be the true, but I think let's not also underestimate 
the fact that in the no, time that we are that. there are no distinctions no, between terrorists and freedom fighters. We need to minimize the risks. We need to minimize the potential explosive situations. So, in the situation that could possibly become potentially explosive, why create a martyr? Why create yet another? When you could have simply taken him and kept him in a jail, you had you had that kind of power with, uh, over him. I said a quote from you, we won't call the argumentative Indian. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a perfect example. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, in some sense, I guess my one comment on Guran Mahdi is the fact that you can refer to an encounter, and anybody yes. from India knows exactly what that means, uh, strikes me as a real symptom of what this one is. I mean, an encounter killing should not take place in a divorce. Yes, a community uh, yes. that that is. Well, they should be thoroughly pro. Every so called encounter that the security forces say they are undertaking should be thoroughly pro. Was it an encounter or did you simply murder someone in cold blood? We have a few minutes uh, to raise some questions. We're going to take a couple because there's several hands, so ask your question and then we'll let our guests answer the one question. We'll start with one. Yes. Uh, so I Based on your uh, on your experiences in covering the issue and what you've heard from from our sources and your own experience, how have you how has well the way they've gone about trying to get it through changed from how it how, how it would have been done earlier in the decade or, or earlier times and how has how is in your view the, the coverage of the issue overall? Look, I think prohibition is one of the worst ideas <laughs> that any government can impose through state dictum without creating a real public awareness campaign about the ill effects of, of drink. Uh, you know, and, and particularly the way the Bihar government is doing it. You know, it has been used to the danda. You know, when the policeman comes into your house, can come into your house, you've got a drink, and as per, the, uh, as per that, uh, uh, the law that they brought in, you can even arrest the people in, in the house, not just the person who was drinking, but all the others as, as collaborators in a way. I mean, that is a terrible way to be running a state. I mean, what will happen? You will only have a flourishing uh, industry uh, of, of, of uh, uh, liquor going underground and bootleggers flourishing. That's what has been the traditional practice. No one is saying that you don't need to spread a public awareness campaign about the dangers of liquor and you know about, about excessive liquor being drunk. But you cannot do it in the manner that the Bihar government uh, is doing it. And that's not what they were elected for. You know, the, the real issues of Bihar are not about, you know, a, a, about imposing a sort of rather draconian prohibition law. The real issues of Bihar, again, come back to basic issues of, you know, infrastructure, of, of, uh, of hunger, of, of uh, uh, education. I mean, those are the critical issues of our time. And, you know, one of the problems, and even here, we have, you know, the real issues of India are frankly not these you know, these are the spurious issues that politicians use. Nitish Kumar uses prohibition. Someone else, uh, Narendra Modi will talk about of cultural nationalism. Someone else will talk about Gauraksha and cow slaughter and meat packs. Are these the real issues that should concern a country of 1.25 billion, where at least a third still lives possibly below the poverty line? I mean, what, what kind of an India do we want? I mean, the real battles, even within the media, these issues, the real issue that concerns India today, in my view, is that 10 lakh young Indians, which is a million young Indians, are entering the job market every month. We are the youngest society in the world, between 18 and 35, 65% of Indians are below the age of 35. What are you doing to create the basis to provide them the kind of employment that they need to make them Indians who have, you know, because this is also the most aspirational mobile society in the world. More, more mobile than America was 100 years ago. Every Indian wants a better life for his or her daughter and, will bring, uh, and son and will bring every value for that. What are you doing to create a conducive atmosphere for them to grab opportunity, equal opportunities? I mean, to my mind, equal opportunities in edu education and employment should be the core of the debate. Instead, the debate gets fitted on prohibition in Bihar or the debate in, 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 in the national capital gets Fitted on issues of cow slaughter, or, or, or uh, you know, or, 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 or you stir this nationalism versus Pakistan, and believe that that is your permanent enemy, and that's the battle that you've got to fight. Why is it the war mongering takes place, you know, at, at the, on the eve of the elections in India? 
Because when our politicians have no answer to the real issues that confront the people, they bring about this imaginary enemy or real enemy. But an enemy which is not going to, you know, war is not going to resolve the problem. We spend far too, we spend more on defense than on education. What kind of a bizarre subcontinent is this? You know, our war should be, and the Prime Minister said it to his credit, is to be against poverty and illiteracy. And not against, you know, against, uh, you know, how are we and Pakistan going to sort of two nuclear neighbors? What do we want to do? We want to go to war which will destroy both. So I don't know. I think prohibition is a classic example of how governments go away from the main issues uh, of the day. Nitish Kumar should be focusing on how do I provide all those thousands of young Biharis jobs? Not how do I go into people's house, knock on the door at midnight and see whether they're drinking or not. Or you can be as well. I should just say, I take this opportunity to say that tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. up on the seventh floor of the ICC building, Prime Minister is going to be uh, doing a little panel on women's rights issues and uh, public media. So for those who are, there's so many issues we won't get to talk about yeah, this afternoon. Yeah. Climate change strikes is another one that we almost yeah. never talk about even though we're in a crisis in that setting as well. Anyone who identifies a question? Hi, uh, so my question is, like, we're talking about so many issues. My question is more about how you think the media is covering them. When, we, when you, you yourself spoke about how television as a media, uh, as a source of getting information for news, is something that is available to the middle class and above. When, we, when we're talking about a country where a huge chunk of the population is below the poverty line, when we're talking about alternative sources of news information being limited to the internet, which majority of the country does not have access to, to what extent is this gap in information and this gap in perspective going to be remedied for the people who do not have access to multiple sources of information and who are only being fed a certain narrative, which usually gets fed through you know big companies with TV and with more coverage? That's a very good question. I think. Uh, Lower down the income scale, you have people consuming media in the vernacular languages, in their own local languages. And the local language stations, many of them are often driven by political agendas and often driven by creating a particular narrative. So uh, I think the people lower down the income scale in India certainly do and certainly are very vulnerable to uh, political mobilization through the news media. But you know, I mean, I would say that that is changing very, very rapidly. The number of people now getting smartphones, the number of people, I mean, I, I don't have the figures of internet uh, connectivity right now, but uh, internet connectivity is exploding in leaps and bounds through India's uh, areas. I mean, through the income sections. I mean, you can have, you now have income, uh, you have internet in, in every language. So uh, it's not as if there are blind areas completely without any kind of information whatsoever. Yes, there are. Of course, there are areas in Bastar and uh, the areas in, in the northeast and in particularly areas also in, in central India. But I think the uh, lower down the income scale, you do have people who are very vulnerable to the kind of messaging that the local news operator or the local news outlet is giving them. And those often tend to be political. They often tend to be driven by the money interests that are uh, that are uh, that are uh, that are uh, funneling them. But also, they have access. Many many now have more access to big city media than we think. That they, than we think. But, but you know, the big city media focuses on the big city. The so-called yeah. national media focuses only really on the big metros. Yeah. I mean, large parts of the country are simply falling off the map. Yeah. You know, I call it the tyranny of distance. But the fact is, if 100 people die in the northeast in the floods. It won't get the kind of reporting if even one person falls into a drain in Delhi. And that's the tragedy of this country. You know, water logging in Delhi or in a Mumbai will, will explode as breaking news. But what's happening in you know, remote Jharkhand or Chhattisgarh? You know, we are a subcontinental client size country. This may be true of media in different But that's possible. English language media. Yeah, but that's, that's, Hindi language media tends to, to be much more local. And I think the local. But farmer suicides. I mean, where is. language media what? tends to. You know, thousands of people have died in India of farmer suicides in the last 20 years. What is the level of media coverage of that issue? And contrast that with the amount of time Indian media spends on cricket. Or the amount of time the Indian media spends on cricket. Or the amount of time that Indian media spends on crime. It's a crime, what we do. It's criminal. So, let me just ask a couple of quick questions. Thank you.
and then let's answer those questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, firstly, I'd like to uh, congratulate you both. I mean, I have deep uh, respect and admiration for the integrity with which you, you know, bring to the profession as journalism. Uh, one question that I had was, uh, in terms of the, at least I feel the very idea of India today is, is under threat. Um, have either of you ever considered entering the political space? Uh, and, you know, very closely, very closely connected to that, is there space for new political parties? Because, you know, if they set the tone, that's, that's only one way that I see forward to, you know, protect the very idea of India. Thank you. It was very lively and, 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 and interesting. I just um, heard Mario Renzi, the Prime Minister of India, this morning, and it was a wonderful short talk that he gave, and it, it really resonated because it was about populism fueled by fear, which we're seeing around us all the time. I remember the 2014 election from far away, and it was populism fueled by optimism, not possibly you know, very rationally thought out, but fueled by optimism. And somehow, what I'm hearing from you now is sort of this pivoting of this populism. It's still populist, but it's pivoted. What is sort of the role of the media to either sort of bear, lay it out to bear, show it exactly for what it is, which is populism of either kind, and then what's the role of the media to uncover that optimism again? Because clearly there are reasons to be optimistic about India beyond the fact that sure. India is indefatigable, right? Sure. I mean, when you're in America, my students now go to India not because there's anything to fix, but because there's something to learn. And that's, you see, there's been a huge shift there. So where is that? Where can we sort of be a little bit more balanced? And what's the role of the media in sort of balancing out that populism based on either side? Just take one more. My name is Utsa, and my question is for you, Sagarika. Uh, you almost presented Burhan Wani as a, a no. Twitterati who went wrong. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. He I said, is he's online. He's a dangerous guy. I said he's a dangerous, dangerous Let me finish. Let me finish. <laughs> he's one of those guys who has been online. He's the commander yeah. of Hezbollah yeah, Mujahideen, yeah. a banned organization, even in the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has been online showing videos calling for establishing an Islamic caliphate along the lines of ISIS. And you made him sound as if he needed a full trial and he had to go through. You know, Usta, actually, he's an extremely dangerous criminal. Let's, we are in complete agreement on that. My only point was to the Indian. Now, you know, this is again the caricaturing of the liberal position, which is unfair. You know, I did not say he's a. He's a you know, don't caricature the liberal. Don't, don't make the liberal out to be what you're saying he's a Facebook Twitterati. I did not say that. Absolutely not. And I want to put that on record. I did not say that. I did not say that. I said he's a very dangerous person who was posing on Facebook with guns and he was in the watch of the CRP. The CRP had him in their, in their grip. My only point was was to kill him only creating a martyr out of, out of uh, creating a martyr out of a criminal. You made a criminal into a martyr. And that's the problem that the security forces have done. <laughs> let, me, let me answer this because I think what you raise is, 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 is fundamentally, it's true here in the United States. You suddenly have an election where you have someone who is probably, uh, probably uh, pushing a populism based on fear. Uh, and, and you're right, I think Narendra Modi's great skill and the difference between him and Donald Trump, although there are some similarities, dare I say, including in a way the pathological narcissism of both the leaders, uh, is that Narendra Modi actually promoted a populism based on optimism. And I think that was important because that enabled Mr. Modi, whether strategically or otherwise, to gain people who otherwise would not have voted for the BJP. And I think the reason why Mr. Trump will lose at the end of the day is that populism based on fear has its limits. You know, you are then unable to attract new voters. I think both these narratives exist in India today. I think the, the narrative based on populism, based on optimism does exist. The government of the day, to its great credit, is putting building blocks 
that maybe 5, 10 years from now will result in already India still growing at 7, 7.5%, blessed no doubt by, uh, by, by certain global factors like the price of oil. But there is no doubt that India possibly in the next 5 to 10 years will remain one of the fastest growing economies of the world, will be able to build some elements of world class infrastructure, and thereby the populism based on optimism, and including the fact that we are this most aspirational society in the world, where everyone, you know, in a sense, is ready to break any door to move ahead, will push India on a trajectory that they've never experienced before. And therefore, the populist sloganeering about, you know, Ache you know, good days are here, will perhaps have a resonance there, uh, will have a resonance in India. Now, Mr. Trump also does a bit of populism based on uh, uh, optimism. Let's make America great again, right? But it is, but it is heavily shadowed by populism based on fear. Now, there are people in Mr. Modi's government, or dare I say, in the Pariva, I won't use the word government, but the Pariva, the wider family, who believe that populism based on fear needs to be brought time and again to galvanize the flock. You see, because while Mr. Modi, much like Tony Blair, in a sense, created new labor, tried to create new BJP, I'm going to give him credit for that. The fact is, there are people within his government who believe that's not the way to be electable all the time. How do I cater to the core? The core wants populism based on fear. Whether you like it or not, there is a core out there which believes that the minorities, in a sense, have to be put in their place. Have to be, in a sense, put in. Therefore, they will not be given tickets. Therefore, they will, from time to time, you will bring in these agitations, which, frankly, why do you need this cow protection agitation in 21st century India? Why do you need a government which, you know, in Haryana, which is the BJP ruled state, which has decided to make all forms, or even Maharashtra, to make all forms of production, sale, trade of cattle uh, a crime? Why? Why do you need that? You're going to only render that poor cattle trader unemployed. You know, and, and, and as someone pointed out to me, many of those cattle, the leather hide is used for your chuffles, which are where many of those small scale factories are run by Hindus. So I think, I think populism based on fear will be one narrative that will be played out from time to time, particularly before elections. And there will be populism based on optimism because there is every reason to be optimistic about India. I mean, just look at the number of people who have also been lifted out of poverty in the last 25 years. You know, the BJP and some would like us to believe that India started in 2014. The fact is from 1991 to 2016, in 25 years, Millions and millions of Indians have been lifted out of poverty as a result of, uh, of, of the opening up of the Indian economy. Now, it may have happened too slowly. There are impediments. There is still huge corruption, both at the top and the bottom. The corruption at the top is much reduced, which is, again, to the great credit of Mr. Modi. But corruption at the bottom still remains. The bureaucracy is still overwhelming over the lives of Indian citizens. So I think, I think in India, no one narrative <coughs> Or populism only based on optimism that everything's going to be fine. Nothing's going to be, every, you know, you, nothing's going to be fine overnight. To be fair to Mr. Modi, though, you know, he is taking on the ideologues in his own way. You know, uh, he ca he can go thus far and no further with the Sam Parivar. He is a person of the Sam. He is an RSS Swayam Seva. But in his own quest to reinvent himself, you see that Mr. Modi, whether it comes to the Gauraksha, on which he has spoken out, saying that 75% of them are anti-social elements, 75% of them are, are, are criminal elements, which you then have to backtrack. Because the RSS said, no, it's not 75%, it's a much smaller number. Mr. Modi then said, oh, a handful of them are anti-social elements. So Mr. Modi, in his own way, is trying to sound a cautionary note to those who are pushing the uh, Hindutva narrative further than he wants to take it, uh, you know, uh, whether it's on whether it's on Pakistani, you know, on the eve of surgical strike, Mr. Modi made I thought a very statesman-like speech in Cozy Court, where he said that India and Pakistan must uh, uh, compete with each other not on on war but on fighting poverty and illiteracy and unemployment. So he was talking not only to Indians but perhaps talking even to the hotheads in his own son Parivar. So I think he's trying in his way to uh, perhaps moderate the ideologues who are pushing towards the populism of fear. <laughs> because I think he himself wants to reinvent himself. I mean, he of course is now has, he believes he's reinvented himself to Vikas Purush from Hindu Riddha Samraj. So 
So I think he is trying to push, uh, you know, even for example, on and, 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 and that's probably the greatness of Indian democracy. That an opponent, that, 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 that someone who starts off his political career as a Hindu Hriday Samra, is eventually forced to become a Vidas to or, or, or a development icon to win elections. And I believe America will also have to do that itself. No leader in America can only survive by being a populist <coughs> democracy. That's what democracy does. Democracy forces eventually even fringe elements, if they want to be electable, to become part of the mainstream. You know, you cannot, you cannot, uh, so, uh, you know, 20 years, 15 years ago, if you spoke to Modi, or, or if you saw his campaign in 2002, in the aftermath of the riots, he appeared to be a figure of fear. I remember he was called the hero of hatred on the cover of India Today at the time. Because, you know, that politics that he sort of, that helped him to win that first Gujarat election was on the back of a bloody conflict. And he did play very, very shamefully, in my view, the politics of fear and the politics of division and dividing communities. In 2014, Mr. Modi's campaign was dramatically different. And it was a campaign which, in my view, was based on being far more inclusive and projecting himself as a governance icon. That's what India does. I mean, if Donald Trump was to fight another election 10 years from now, God forbid he won't, but if he were to, I think he might run a very different campaign. Today, brand Trump sells in a particular uh, marketplace. 10 years from now, you know, maybe America will force even Trump to come to the middle ground. The middle ground is where the politics of great democracies lie. The middle, uh, you know, the politics of great, the, the fringe keeps coming. You'll have a gold water in 64, you have a, uh, you know, you have a Trump in 2016, but they're not lasting, they're not durable figures. And I think Mr. Modi realizes that because the man has a sense of destiny. He believes he's destined to be known as one of India's great prime ministers. He's obsessed with that. That's where the narcissism has both a positive and a negative thing. In your, in, in your narcissistic streak, you believe you can conquer mountains. And therefore, while, while, while it may lead him to sort of, you know, at times not focus on processes and institutions, it also leads him to take risks which other leaders, lesser leaders might not take. So I, 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 I think the jury is still out. Maybe I'm trying to sell my book, having put it on the cover. <laughs> but I, I mean, I mean to, to my mind, that's, you know, I, I, I think we should not easily demonize someone, <coughs> nor should we become cheerleaders. And my worry about journalism, or, or, well, the atmosphere that's being created at the moment is journalists are not supposed to ask questions. If journalists ask Trump questions, he starts, Raising, you know, he, he starts using the most distasteful language against them. And sometimes I wonder, Mr. Modi also falls into the same trap. I mean, when he calls journalists news traders, or when he endorses social media cheerleaders of his who spread hate messages, I mean, why is he inviting, you know, uh, the, the social media warriors of his who are using the most awful language against journalists? You're legitimizing that kind of hate speech. So, you know, this is a complex personality. And therefore, populism by fear and populism by uh, of optimism will, will, will almost function parallelly. And from time to time, one will rear its head, and another time, another force will rear its head. And you've got to live with both. So, uh, it skips off. There's a lot of reason uh, we have to go home to Bombay to remind you of the reason for optimism, the, the diversity and the energy. I think some of that, of course, is thanks to people like you who have chosen to be in the public eye and to uh, see a voice of reason. It's been a real privilege having you at Georgetown. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the conversation. And I, all of you who are here who didn't have a chance to ask questions, I'm sure that Arjun and Sagarika will be happy to spend some time after the formal close of this event. So please join me in thanking them. And <laughs> May I just say in conclusion that it's a privilege to be here in Georgetown. You know, it, it just is wonderful. Uh, that you know you can be in an atmosphere where you can you you can raise these contentious issues without the fear of someone throwing a shoe at you, <laughs> and, 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 and that's wonderful. And I think you know uh, academic cam campuses in, in 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 America promote that kind of uh, free speech and, and and the power to dissent. Tragically, uh, you know I would say there are some Indian campuses where a debate like this could turn rather nasty, and and I don't know about shoes. But you would certainly have uh, the kind of abusive language now being used against, you know, national versus anti-national, which never existed in the past. So to that extent, maybe India has changed. I did answer that one question, this individual about politics. You know, it's very tempting for journalists who cover politics to believe that we can become politicians one day. Uh, and yet, every time you're tempted, uh, it's like, you know, the the, the apple out there. Uh, 
uh, which, which you want to take a bite of. And then you realize that if you take a bite, uh, you can't just sort of take a bite and move away. Then you're going to have to go and grab it 24 by 7. And that involves a lot of compromises on what you've stood for. So I think, you know, it's easier to be on the outside as journalists and criticize and, and observe <laughs> than actually be part of that, that, that horrible rat race that politics is, particularly in India. I think it's a, it's a tough place to be in. I mean, I end, you know, we've got a presidential debate tonight. I mean, if someone called me a liar and said, I, you know, I'm going to put you in jail, I mean, I would cringe and... But you know, you guys are, I know there's a lot of disillusionment about your election at the moment, but as far as Rajiv and I are concerned, you know, being here and talking to you guys and meeting people in Washington, we're very impressed with the American Democratic debate, honestly. I think there is so much free thought, there's so much uh, argument, and it's it's a very lively, very dynamic place. No wonder this is the world's greatest democracy. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> well, let's continue the conversation. Thank you. <laughs>